Good afternoon and welcome to the Cambridge Health Alliance Health is Well. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm Director of Marketing and Outreach for the Geriatric Division of the Cambridge Health Alliance, including the PACE program. And today we have Dr. Lewis Leo. Did I say it right. right? Yes, you got it. Yes. And Dr. Leo is a uh, Chief of Urology at Cambridge Health Alliance mm -hmm. and instructor at Harvard Medical. That's correct. Did I get that all you right? Got, you got it all, yes. And so today we have a, a very important subject, which is mm -hmm. getting more and more prevalent. We're hearing more and more about prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Leo is our expert on it. And sure. so what is the prostate? Maybe we should start by telling the folks what it is. And yes. He came prepared. So I did come prepared. Here is a little model. Um, I would say I show this to all my patients. And here is the bladder. Here is the prostate. And it is between, uh, it's a gland that's about the size of a walnut, about 30, 20 to 30 grams. And it's between the bladder and the penis. So it actually uh, is a very important gland because it makes all the fluid that allows in reproduction. So, um, but as men get older, it is a natural um, uh, progression that the prostate gets bigger. So whenever you hear of enlarged prostate, you're really talking about the prostate blocking the channel fr from the bladder and the urine stream actually slowing down. There's all sorts of symptoms that we as urologists see from men as they get older and as the prostate gets bigger. So do we know why it always enlarges? So Is most it just of, like sort of muscles and everything just kind of sagging or? So no, it's more of a stretching? gland. Uh, the glands get bigger and they block the channel that leads from the bladder out through the penis. So they block the urinary canal. So can we and, keep it from getting bigger? Well, there are actually no real interventions overall at the very beginning. Okay, and as men, when they're younger, they have no problems, but as they get older, the stream slows down, they have to get up at night, they have to run to the bathroom a lot, and so that's when they come see me, and that is just one part of the uh, aspect of prostate. The other aspect is prostate cancer. So we have been inundated with the blood test called PSA, prostatic uh, specific antigen, and this PSA test is a blood test and it's given to you by your primary care doctor. At a particular age? So that's very controversial. Oh. There's been a huge task force to look to see if we intervene and screen men for prostate cancer and we can catch it earlier, can we make them live longer? And that's still, quite honestly, it's still out there that there is no definitive answer. So there are some organizations like the American Cancer Society, the American Urologic Society, for, uh, um, which I am a member of, that advocate screening, but they advocate screening in men starting at age between 50 and 55. And then they advocate stop, stopping the screening at age 70. Oh, really? Yes. Because Why? as you get older, your chances of having prostate cancer actually go higher. But... It, and it's a part of aging. We know that from autopsy series. When men, they looked at men's prostates after they died of a heart attack, a stroke, um, any other causes, when they've looked at their prostates, uh, men in their 60s, 70s, 80s, they've seen a rapid, a progression of increased uh, prostate cancer that they found incidentally. Now these men died of other causes, never knew they had prostate cancer. Really? So, so yes. Symptoms? There are no no symptoms. symptoms. There are no symptoms. There are no symptoms. And that's the... That's a sneaky one. It is, well, like most cancers. Why? Early it? stages, there are no symptoms. Same, same in breast cancer. There are no symptoms. Now, again, a lot of men, what makes this very tricky is that when men start getting a slow stream, they start running to the bathroom a lot, and they start having symptoms, they automatically think they have cancer. But in essence, most of the time... Cancer doesn't cause these symptoms. It's the enlarged prostate that causes these symptoms. And that's much more common is the BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now that's benign, meaning it's not cancer. It's just an enlargement of your prostate. So we as urologists treat both. We look for BPH or the non-cancer enlargement of the prostate, but we also 
do look at and try and screen for prostate cancer. And again, the treatments are very different. So, can I ask a question? Sure. I'm full of questions. Absolutely. Um, yeah. If if uh, there's uh, prostate cancer in the family, is it something that's hereditary? So that is actually very, there are some risk factors for prostate cancer. Now, everybody's asked me, you know, is it something I ate? Is it my lifestyle? None of those have really borne out to be um, factual, all right? Mm -hmm. But there are two um, factors okay. that people have looked at, okay? The first one is family history, first degree relative, all right? So again, we're talking a brother, a father, maybe even an uncle, okay. first degree if they've had cancer, prostate cancer. But also, at how old were they when they had cancer? Remember I said, if you just gave me an 80-year-old, uh, any 80-year-old man off the street, I would tell you, without knowing anything about him, I would tell you he probably has a very good chance, maybe over 50% chance of having prostate cancer in his prostate. However, he probably has a very low chance of dying from prostate cancer only because as men get older, they have less years of life to live. So an 80-year-old has less years of life to live than a 50-year-old. Makes sense, hopefully. right, on average, right. hopefully. And so that means that prostate cancer, because it's a very slow-growing cancer, it, in an 80-year-old, even if they had really aggressive cancer, it's debatable whether they would die of that cancer. Okay, you know? get and that. So I, I would tell you that overall, that's a first-degree relative who has had cancer young in their life. We're talking their 50s or 60s and who maybe died from prostate cancer, all right? So that's one risk factor. If you told me your dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer when he was 85, I would say probably that's not that much of an increased risk. Okay. The second characteristic is ethnicity. For whatever reason, men with African origins, so that means African-Americans, that means people from Haiti, or South America that have African origins, um, their prostates seem to harbor prostate cancer at a higher rate. At and a younger age? At a younger age and more aggressive. Oh. So those were, would be the two main risk factors out there that I would say, you know, if you're in your 50s and you have one or both of those risk factors, you probably should talk to your primary care doctor to say, hey, uh, could I be screened for prostate cancer? And that's the simple PSA test. That's that the right? simple PSA oh, maybe, test. And the other one as well? Well, so here, there's more controversy. Many, many years ago, and I can remember that because I'm old enough, it used to be that every man got a digital rectal exam, a finger in the bottom to feel the prostate. Right. Now, I still tell the primary care doctors that it's appropriate to do a digital rectal exam if you want to check out sphincter tone, you want to check to make sure there isn't blood in the stool, a guaiac, you want to make sure there isn't any rectal masses. But if all you're doing it for is to feel the prostate and to feel if there's bumps or lumps in it, it's not a very good test. And all the data now has shown that. Yeah. So in fact, the PSA is much better test than just sticking a finger in. And a little and, easier, I would think. And quite honestly, I would tell you, I've done a lot of prostate cancer screenings. And all the men have told me, I'd rather you put a needle in my arm to draw some blood than a finger in my bottom to feel my prostate. And I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. So I, I tell you now, don't be, and I've, I've seen that as a hurdle to screening. A lot of men think, hey, if I go and get my prostate screened, the doctor is going to put a finger in my bottom. I don't want that to happen. So I'm not going to get screened. So I would just put which the word dangerous. out. Which is dangerous. You know, again, and we all know men, men are men, women are women. <laughs> Right. And it's really the men that have their women bring them in. They're kicking and dragging, you know, sh screaming and dragging into the doctor's office to get screened. And the women will do that. However, the men can find a way to get out of it, they will. And hopefully not having the finger test is, is yet another uh, barrier that we can knock down so men can actually get screened, the ones that, are, that want to be screened. They can deal with the blood test. Yes, Anyone can deal with a blood test. Right. Yes. So, um, should we go right to treatment or are we not? You know, this, is there more? So, again, very good question. So, now, recently, and, you know, it, it, it's kind of caught on in the United States, but it started in Canada. The Canadians said, hey, if we have 80-year-olds dying of heart attacks with prostate cancer, 
it can't be all that bad. Not all of prostate cancer, okay? Not to say, I don't wanna say that prostate cancer is a benign cancer, because every year, anywhere from 20 to 30,000 men will die from prostate cancer, all right? But that's much smaller percentage of how many men actually are walking around with prostate cancer. And nowadays, because the Canadians were did their due diligence, did the studies, they watched men with prostate cancer without doing any treatment. And most of the men with low-grade prostate cancer, in fact, almost, I think, all of the men with low-grade prostate cancer that had no treatment survived. And so now, in the United States, we've, we've termed this active surveillance. So the way I kind of think about it is, um, I always think of uh, law enforcement and active surveillance. What are they doing? They're actually monitoring criminals, not arresting them, and just catching them if they're going to do the crime. If they're not going to do the crime, they leave them alone. So that's what we do for prostate cancer now. And I have to say, in my own patient population of men that have prostate cancer, maybe about 80% of them, I don't do anything. We just watch it. We do, we do active surveillance. Do you do, you do an x-ray or an MRI? or how, what's Another that? great question. And what's recently, so in the past, it was only we have to repeat a biopsy, which men were not very happy about. Or we would, and or we would check a PSA, so the blood test. Now, uh, what we've, what I've actually brought it into Cambridge Health Alliance in the last two years is MRI of the prostate, and oh. this is a game changer because we can actually get a nice picture of the prostate, and it can show us whether there are lesions that we can actually target and go after. If there are no lesions, we leave you alone because there's nothing to go after. And if lesions are cuts or, or... Or like a tumor or uh, like or a, a, a bump or something abnormal in the prostate. So think of it, <laughs> I, I heard this term. I mean, it's, it's a little corny, but think of it instead of a mammogram, it's a manogram. It's a, I like it's, it, yes. but it's probably a lot easier. But well, male, the well the woman. yes, maybe. <laughs> I think you don't have to like kind of smush everything and squish everything. Yeah. Uh, you go through the MRI scanner and you get a nice picture of the prostate. So is it a regular full MRI? It's just an MRI of the pelvis. That's of it. Pelvis. Yes. So you get your contrast and you just go right oh, through. Contrast. Right. Mm. And so I think it's much more tolerable. And in fact, and just so yes. our folks know that contrast is the dye that they put into our system so that they can see things. That's more right. Clearly, right. So think of it as normally an x-ray is black and white. If you put the contrast in, you get a color picture. And that's what we want. We want a color picture of the prostate. Okay. And it's gotten so good that I, I have heard from my uh, English colleagues uh, over in the UK that they've decided no man will get a prostate biopsy before they get an MRI. Ah. So they get an MRI first. And again, it's non-invasive. So you don't right. have to stick any needles in. But and, ten, MRIs tend to be expensive. So are we embracing that? So in the UK system, it's a unit. So one MRI unit is the same as one biopsy unit. They are equal. In the United States, unfortunately, Exactly as Roberta has said, the MRI costs a lot more than the biopsy. So the one limiting factor, I hate to say, is insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Some will pay for it and will go ahead and get it. Others will say you have to stick a man 12 times in their prostate first before we will pay for an MRI. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, um, but I'm hoping that eventually as we see the English experience and they see that they've saved their men from bleeding, infection, from these prostate biopsies. And ultimately, cost down the line in treating with all the testing and all of the... Absolutely, right? right. So, so I, do, I do have hope for that. Okay. But we are, we've been doing it at CHA. We've had some great results. And in springboarding off of that, if we have a lesion, so this is very controversial now in the New England area, but I have spearheaded it. And basically, if we have a lesion in the prostate and we biopsy it and we find that there's cancer that we need to treat, would it be outside the norm to actually just treat that lesion rather than taking the whole prostate out or radiating the whole prostate? Because right now, 
quite honestly, we have two, two major choices for men with prostate cancer that need treatment, that need, may or may not need treatment. The first choice is on one end, we don't do any treatment and we just watch it, active surveillance. On the other side though, we do something called a radical prostatectomy. They don't call it radical for, for nothing, I gotta tell you. It is, I've done, I've done probably over a thousand of these surgeries in my training and out, outside in the last 20 years. And I would tell you that is very radical, that we are really rearranging your whole plumbing system. And again, when you get leaks and you have all these other side effects, it's not surprising. Right. So we have radical surgery and we have nothing to do nothing and follow active surveillance. So we need something in the middle. We do. Yeah. And so that's where I've been working in that space, you know. And so I do think that for men, there are a lot more choices now than there were ever before. There are a lot more diagnostic choices. Some of the old fashioned uh, aspects like the digital rectal exam have gone by the wayside and we've brought in MRI. Part, unless they're looking for... Unless they're looking for something else. Right. If they're doing it all together in an annual physical, that's fine. Okay. But I usually do tell, and I, you know, I actually don't, I'm very selective with digital rectal exams now. I rarely ever do digital rectal exams. Only because the MRI... The phone might be ringing. It's so much better. <laughs> so much better. And you know, I'm the kind of guy that I would say, do unto others what you would have done unto you. And again... I would want an MRI first, so that's why, and I would want focal therapy for myself if that were to come to that case. So I do offer it to my patients, and we have a very long discussion because the real issues in prostate cancer, there's so much out there, the data is still in evolution, and there is no right or wrong answer. I tell my patients all the time. The key is shared decision making, and that means that I give you the information and you as the patient ask me questions and tell me what your preference is. You know, I don't want to say this is absolutely the right course or that's the absolute right course. And I think that uh, that's the best approach to prostate cancer at this time. But you would lay out all the pros and cons of each. Absolutely. So I have another question. Sure. The, um, I, the treatment that might be in the middle, is that that injection treatment? Is that not in the middle? No. So that would be, so the treatment that I'm talking about is what we call focal therapy of the prostate. So think of it in terms of breast cancer. Remember, when breast cancer was first treated, they did the whole mastectomy, took the whole breast off, did the whole lymph node dissection. These women were disfigured. And, you know, the answer was, well, we're going to save your life. So we're going to do this radical mastectomy. Mm -hmm. And then time went on. And they said, okay, we have mammography. We can find the lump. When we see the lump and find the lump and get it, we can do a lumpectomy and remove just that area with maybe a little localized treatment. And you won't have some of the side effects that the old surgery had caused. Right. So that's kind of where I'm talking about is moving to the middle. Oh. Injection therapy is much different. That's in general for cancer that's already spread. Not oh, that's really? localized in the prostate. Oh, so could, could you explain um, that injection therapy? Sure. So um, a long time ago, the only urologist that won the Nobel Prize for Medicine showed that if he castrated, if he removed the testicles, removed the source of testosterone, prostate cancer would regress. It doesn't get cured, but it would fall back and eventually it could come back later on and be hormone resistant. But for the time being, he could actually uh, induce a, a regression of the prostate cancer by removing the hormones. Now there's two ways to do the hormones. Way back when, when he won the Nobel Prize, the only way was surgical castration, mm -hmm. meaning just surgically removing the testicles. Mm -hmm. However, a new, you know, with the new pharmaceutical companies, they came out with a way for chemical castration. And that's what the shot is. Mm -hmm. It's a shot that will diminish your testosterone production and basically castrate you. Now, once you do that, the prostate cancer will regress. But it's not cured. It doesn't all die. Mm -hmm. A part of it then becomes resistant and will come back again. Mm -hmm. And that's when sometimes you need chemotherapy or, you, or there are actually new drugs coming out now that will 
block the testosterone receptor or block the production of testosterone. So there's some exciting stuff at the, at the other end of prostate cancer, the, the later stages too. So there's exciting stuff at the beginning for diagnosis and certainly in the middle for treatment, but now that toward the end, they're coming up with some better drugs too in that area. And that would, of course, prolong life. And um, it can be quite painful, can it? Yes. So if it spreads to the bone, the bone pain is excruciating. So there can be a palliative effect on these uh, with the hormone ablation or the, uh, the castration. And also they have medications to strengthen the bones uh, that can be infused into you. So there are some While ways... While they're giving you this other medication, that's they right. give you both simultaneously. That's right. Because osteoporosis right. is one of the main side effects of taking away a man's testosterone. And of course, women are more prone to osteoporosis because they have very little testosterone to begin with, right. obviously, because they're women and they have estrogen. Right. So for men, if you take away their testosterone, they can get osteoporosis very quickly. They almost, they basically go through menopause. It's called andropause. So they're going through that, hot flashes and everything else. Really? Yes. And so it's not... At any age? At any age, if you take away their testosterone. So again, it's not without side effects because right. most people say, well, you know, just give a shot every three months and you'll be better. But they do, their quality of life suffers too. They have fatigue, they have hot flashes, their bones get brittle. So all these things are not good effects later on and not part of quality of life either. Right. Especially as we age and we get a little more frail. Sure. And our mobility can be affected anyway. That's right. And it sounds like chance of falling increases yep. with, and then breaking. That's if right. We fall. Hip Not fractures, good. of course. That's it's very well known that in the elderly, you know, if you're getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and you trip and fall and you break your hip, it's it's pretty much that's one of the the ending events for most mm -hmm. elderly. Right. So it's so to try and prevent that would be great. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're always trying to prevent that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, it, so everything is case by case. It's of course. individual. Uh, Absolutely. Right? Based so, on, on what is going on with you right. at that particular time, where you are in life. Yep. Right? Yes. Whether you're younger. So let's talk about when, when you are younger mm -hmm. and you're a man in your 50s and you're sexually active. That's right. I would, see, I, I would imagine that um, having this prostate gets in the way. Mm, of course. So here, here's the problem. All right. So on one side... If you have a man in their 50s, you know, the average life expectancy for men in the United States now, it's probably in their late 70s. So you're talking probably 20 more years of life. Okay. But if you ask any man in those 20 years, would you want to live a high quality of life, meaning have a good, you know, uh, intimate relationship, being, you know, not, you know, not being able to uh, to stay away from any sort of pads or diapers or anything like that. Mm. Every, anybody, I think, would say, yes, I'd rather have that. But then if you ask them, well, okay, with the chance of maybe being cured of prostate cancer, what, how would you weigh that? And that's where I think every man's a little different. Some men would say, I'll trade all that in and I'll take the chance for all those side effects if I'm cured of prostate cancer and I don't die of prostate cancer. Other men would say, well, wait a minute. If you have all these tools that can monitor things and you, you're already putting people on active surveillance and not treating them, well then, I'm willing to kind of watch things and if I have to treat, I will treat. If I don't have to treat and I can keep all my sexual potency and, and all my uh, you know, uh, urinary uh, continence, then I'd rather do that. Every man's a little different. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you, you know, if you keep hearing that computers and artificial intelligence are going to replace doctors, I think it's a long way off. You're, because I have this conversation with every one of my men, every one of my patients, and every patient, believe it or not, you might think they're going to take one choice, but they'll sometimes surprise you and take another choice. And so, and sometimes they'll say, hey, even though nine out of 10 urologists say, say I should have my prostate taken out, I don't want that taken out. I want what's and new and progressive. And that would be just radical. 
That would be the radical that press we're attack. Talking about. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but instead, I want you to watch it. Or instead, I want you to do focal therapy. Or instead, I might want, you know, radiation therapy or something new. So people are, I think, in general, are pretty intelligent, pretty savvy uh, consumers. They do their research. They talk to uh, phys multiple physicians sometimes. So when I was at the Cleveland Clinic where I trained, uh, certainly we had people coming from all over the world getting second, third, fourth opinions. And at the end of the day, the doctors can only tell you what's out there, what the data says. You still really have to make that decision because there's always a risk-benefit ratio for anything you choose. Right. Yeah. Right. Pick and choose. Pick and choose. As right. it is in everything in life. Right. Mm -hmm. With the best information you have available to you. Now, that's right. not to say, I always tell my patients, here's the other thing. You know, you don't know what's going to happen in five years from now, right? Right. And so, again, it's almost like, well, if we take your prostate out today, we can't put it back in five right. years later. But if we watch it and something, and it gets worse, well, then maybe in a few years, something new comes along. Right. Like I said, this MRI, I've only, I started at uh, Cambridge Health Alliance probably about two years ago. And I've been there now, chief of urology, for 12 years. So I've, I still see patients that I saw, you know, five, seven years ago, and they go, why didn't I get the MRI? Right. And I said, well, you know, at the time, we didn't have the capabilities. Right. The technology wasn't there. But now it's there. So now we can get the MRI for you. Right. It always amazes yeah. me, and we have about one more minute. Okay, so I sure. want you to, yeah. to either summarize or, uh, or leave uh, folks with something, uh, an important piece of information that you Absolutely. would like to leave. Yeah. But what I want to say, it always amazes me for a community hospital, mm -hmm. all of the things that we do with the Cambridge Health Alliance. And we have some pretty advanced, you know. It, uh, it's amazing. I think our patient population uh, is fantastic. They are very grateful, um, you know, and, and obviously now with what's going on in the country, it's a very supportive city, the city of Cambridge. Right. The hospital's very supportive. Um, I've worn my butterfly tie in support. And so I think um, it is, it, it's, it's a privilege to practice. Here. Yes, it's a privilege to practice at CHA. And I've had developed many close relationships. And I think the people there are, are, are world class. Mm -hmm. So I just would like to summarize because the hospital has supported me in this endeavor. And they've seen the um, so we've actually put together a flyer on focal therapy. We've actually put a website on. It's challiance.org backslash focal cryoablation. And, you know, I've even had patients. Uh, the hospital has interviewed the patients that I've treated. And the first patient I treated with this technology was back in 2008. That may seem like a long time ago, but I've slowly accumulated all that data and I presented all this um, not only at the New England American Neurologic Association last year, but at an international meeting in Japan uh, in February of this year. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten the word out. And there's many, there's people throughout the world doing this. But unfortunately, there's no one in this area doing this except for myself. Wow. And so. Well, we are fortunate to have well, you. Thank you. And thank you. I am fortunate to have <laughs> you come on the show. So thank you. I for appreciate coming. the invitation. And, and uh, next year, uh, Dr. Leo is going to come on and talk about female issues and in, incontinence. And that's things. right. We have to so. give equal time. <laughs> that's so, right. And, and I, I enjoy uh, working certainly with my female patients too. Obviously not on prostate. But I, I do uh, feel very grateful to, for them to trust me in helping them with their bladder issues. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Roberta.